and what's coming up on your horizon. Well, the American middle class has been shrinking for decades, and many believe that disturbing trend can be traced back to our overemphasis of the benefits of a college education. Today, we spend our time looking at a new push to steer would-be workers into the technical fields. We increasingly have had a problem with workforce for a long time, finding good trained workers. I sit down with the CEO of Snap-on Tools to see why he believes technical education could determine the future of multi-billion dollar companies like his and the American economy. Career and technical education in that competition, in that conflict, is our greatest weapon. Recapturing the American dream by rolling up our sleeves and getting to work this week on Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, it's been called the American dream, the ideal that anyone, no matter their birth or status in life, can better themselves through hard work and perseverance. Yet, our country trails many in the developed world in social mobility, an issue that state leaders believe can only be solved with a new attitude about some old jobs. It's called the new minimum, and it's where we begin today. But our biggest challenge is finding skilled workers. We're in crisis. We're in a crisis mode now. We increasingly have had a problem with workforce for a long time, finding good trained workers. We like to call it a skills gap. So for us to move at a fast pace, we're going to have to have skill sets and people that also move at that pace. There's lots of job for highly skilled college degrees or, or technical program individuals. Good jobs, a wide degree of choice, and, and very good pay scales. We manufacture a product called a centralizer for the oil and gas industry. There are bodies available that uh, we can't hire because they do not have the skill levels that we need. So we need to do a better job, I think, of preparing the emerging workforce for the positions that are available. Nordam is a global aerospace repair and manufacturing company. Everything is moving so fast. Our industry is leapfrogging. And what we need is a skilled workforce, both college degreed and technical degreed, in order to be successful. Career Tech's mission is a job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company you have a surprising number of young people, especially, that are simply disengaged from the workforce. They clearly want to work, they just were mismatched with the workforce. They're frantically looking for work, but every time they go in, they don't have the right credentials, they don't have the right skill sets. My company is Mills Machine Company in Shawnee, and we're a manufacturer of earth drilling tools and bits. Give me someone that has some basic training, some basic skills, and has some of the life skills like communication and teamwork and problem solving and working with other people, and we'll do the rest of the training. This center is in the Global Research Network of General Electric, so this is the first Global Research Center dedicated to one industry, and it's solely dedicated to the oil and gas industry. Our typical profile is going to be upper end technology based professionals. So you need a workforce that is very flexible, that is comfortable with technology. This is not your grandfather's manufacturing anymore. The workplace has become very sophisticated, much more complex. So you have two things happening. You need high-end academics. You also need significant technical skills. In the manufacturing world, college isn't necessarily as important 
as the in industrial certification programs that give people the kind of skills that are needed out in a factory environment. In fact, some of the highest paying jobs in the economy are manufacturing positions. We started this generation-long belief that the only way to a successful career was through college. College is not for everyone, and even if someone's not going to become an engineer, they still need technical training because it's a very technical world. The new minimum just relates to trying to encourage high school students to understand that at the very minimum, they need some type of certification in order to establish a career. And that basic certification will get them a job. So the new minimum, high school diploma and an industry credential or an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, you cannot stop with an academic high school diploma. We've ignored what the workforce needs as we think about our education. We've kind of followed this one-size-fits-all solution. I want to ask educators, what are you training these kids for? You know, what are, what's your education about? To create a life, to create a career after they graduate. It appears as we sterilize the K-12 environment to academics only, we failed to acknowledge the value of building, doing, creating. The business community needs to partner with the education community. And I see opportunities for educators to, to bring in mentors. I, the corporate world can help here. Parents can help here. They need to have that mentor in, in grade school or middle school that excites them. We have an internship program, and that's where we actually bring through a lot of our talent. They get trained here, they participate in our company, and then usually they're the pipeline for our future stakeholders. One thing I would encourage is more programs like that, working with schools. In kindergarten, first and second grade, you actually expose them to a whole range of careers. We've always done it. We've shown them firemen and football players and a doctor, but we forgot to show them cybersecurity, manufacturing, outdoors work, sales. So we want to start early, encourage them to get into those technical fields. We're going to be very interested in supporting of the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics type profile. The more we can get down to a common language about what it is that you really need, the educators are much better positioned. The young people would be much better served. Do what you like. This, you know, think about going to a job. It's fun every day, and I get paid to do this? Wow. Doesn't get any better than that. That's the buttons we've got to find with our youth. There's a lot of competition out there, and the world's moving really fast, and innovation is happening at, at scale. So we have to innovate, whether it's energy, or whether it's clean water, or whether it's healthcare services. That has to happen, and somebody's going to compete for those products, and it might as well be us, and, and we need to go out there and fight and win. President Obama devoted a substantial portion of his 2014 State of the Union address to explaining how he plans to improve the nation's economy by connecting unemployed workers with skilled, starved employers. Now, if you'd like to see what state leaders are trying to do to solve that same problem, just head to OKHorizon.com and look for a couple of skills gap stories under this week's value added section. When we return, we'll talk with a CEO who says the first step in closing that skills gap is by changing some attitudes. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, Nick Pinchuk is the Harvard-educated CEO and chairman of Snap-on Incorporated, an S&P 500 company valued at close to $3 billion. So it may come as a bit of a surprise that Pinchuk believes that as a society, we've put too much emphasis on college degrees. 
Speaking to members of the Governor's Business Roundtable, he told state leaders the American dream is being threatened by the mistaken belief of what it means to be a success in today's America. We are not Americans because we have a common ancestry. We come from all over. Nor do we share a particular religion. All forms of worship are practiced here. Nor even a specific geography. The map has changed. Map of America has changed as many times as the stars on the states. America is America because we are based on ideas. Americans are Americans because we have certain beliefs. And among those most important is we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I want you to concentrate on the last one, pursuit of happiness. And what the founders meant with that was prosperity. The middle class, the American dream. And so it was. The idea of America pursuing the American dream. Now, why, why is it America, how has America become what it has been today? Well, David Landis, the Harvard professor who wrote Wealth and Poverty of Nations and talks about why is it that certain nations are ascendant economically and in lifestyles over others, talks about America. He says, America was ascendant because of our middle class who knew how to make things and do things and get things accomplished and create prosperity. More recently, Paul Kennedy talks about World War II in The Engineers of Victory, and he says the soldiers created an important component of winning World War II. But there was another aspect of it. The people who were in the factories, people like Rose Hill Monroe, who came out of the, the hills of Kentucky and worked in a, a factory in Willow Run, Michigan, and she and her sisters created the industrial base. She became known as later as Rosie the Riveter. And she created the industrial base that allowed us to win the one war we could not afford to lose, middle class Americans delivering us. Mr. Pinchot, where did we slip up in terms of our shrinking middle class? Well, I think that what happened in the middle class is that two things happened. We allowed people to re change or reassess what they thought the American dream was. That is to redefine the, the American dream had always been the idea of establishing yourself in America, getting a job that would create a great a living, that would create prosperity and stability for your family and pride and fulfillment for you. And over time, we started to interpret that American dream as something like you had to achieve at the highest levels to be a TV anchor, to be a, uh, a uh, CEO, to be an attorney, to be a, uh, an investment banker, and to have gone to a very prestigious four-year college. That was, became the American dream. But in fact, the American dream always has been, and what has been most powerful about America is so many people can participate in it. Everyone cannot be an investment banker or a TV anchor or a doctor. And so that, I think, is the fundamental basis for this. And then along those ways, sort of associated with that, we started to lose respect for the dignity of the work done by the people in the middle, the people on the line, the people who did welding, even though welding is very difficult to do in a, in a correct way. Car mechanics, even though cars today are much more complicated than we've ever seen. In fact, there are, there are more lines of code on a car today than on some airplanes. And so the people who repair them have to be very, very skilled. And yet we have maybe reduced some of the respect and the, the dignity we give to those people. That's where we slipped up. So this is my message. America is a great country. And it's a great country because of the middle class and the achievement of the American dream. It has succeeded not only because of the brilliance of the few, but the efforts of the many. We are challenged today because we're in a global competition, a conflict, and our number one, our number one weapon in that conflict is career and technical education, which will upskill our workforce and allow them to differentiate them and win the competition to be the amplifiers for the ideas. Grow the middle class again. And to do that, and to do that, as businessmen, 
as educators, as government people, we need to co cooperate to shape the curriculums to be demand-driven. Call in the airstrikes so what kids are studying is exactly what's going to lead to a job. We need to change. We need to change the optical outlook on these jobs. We need to restore the, dig the respect for the dignity of work. We need to bring the American dream back to what made this great, that is prosperity and stability for a family in a great job, not necessarily a rock star job. And we need to change these consolation prizes to an American calling, a national calling. Career and technical education has a heck of a PR problem. A heck of a PR problem. You see, students, young people who go into these jobs often, or pursue these lines of study, often are seen to have settled for the consolation prize of our society. I said this in Washington, in, in a think tank in Washington, and then the audience pushed back and said, it's not true. And I said, OK, how would you feel if your son or daughter told you he was going to be a car mechanic? A great job that delivers prosperity and stability and can't be offshored. And the silence in the audience, you could hear a pin drop. And the face of the people confirmed the answer. These jobs are what other people's kids do, you see. And the problem is, America has lost the respect for the dignity of work. I'm struck every time I go into a manufacturing facility how technical, how modern, and actually how clean they are. Right. Do we have a misconception about what labor is today? I don't know, of course. I mean, that's, that's part of the problem. We, we think of labor, in, particularly in a factory, as being dirty and dark. And that's not the way it is anymore. Labor in a factory is, uh, some of, uh, most of the factories in the United States today are bright and clean, and you can eat off the floor in a lot of cases because this is just good quality. And the machines that are working on those floors are very, very technical. And it takes a skilled person to run them, particularly if you, if you are running a complex product line. One of the reasons why Snap-on is able to manufacture in the United States is we run a complex product line. We, uh, we uh, manufacture 80%, 80 uh, of what we sell off our vans here in America we manufacture right here, even though labor is a large component of what that hand tool is made of. And the reason that is, is because complexity and flexibility are important components in, the, in, in our product line. We offer 65,000 SKUs. So the short runs, the customization, require tremendous knowledge to be able to manage those machines over all those different, uh, different items. And that means that you need a considerable person in that place. And what it does is it allows you to defend American uh, manufacturing, to manufacture right here. We, um, we use, I suppose you could say, the one inalienable advantage that American manufacturers enjoy. That is proximity to the world's greatest market. And, it's so, and, and that proximity is an advantage for us because it's very difficult to lob 65,000 SKUs, a product line which is both complex and needs to be delivered with, which is complex and needs to be delivered with flexibility. It's very difficult to, to create that and lob it 10,000 miles in 12 time zones from Asia. So therefore, proximity is ascendant in this model. We need to restore the American dream to what it was. We need to raise again our respect for the dignity of work. And we need to change these jobs, these careers, from a consolation prize to an American calling, because there is no path to American prosperity in the future without an expanded middle class and an expanded group of people who are enabled and upskilled and capable of doing things. This is the lesson of the last 250 years for America. We need to do it again. You know, it is widely accepted that we have a skills gap here sure. in, in this country. Sure. You set out three areas that we need to address. The first one being career and technical education. Yes. Tell me yes. more. Well, I think actually I would suggest that all of it revolves around career and technical education. Career and technical education in that competition, in that conflict, 
is our greatest weapon. But there are three things which, where business and education and government can cooperate. One is shaping the curriculum, making curriculum demand-driven so it matches uh, the jobs that are actually out there. And business has to be active in doing this. But it takes the idea that the company needs to realize that it needs to be active in guiding the curriculum. Otherwise, the curriculum won't match. Uh, the National Association of Manufacturers says that 600,000 jobs just in manufacturing are open simply because we can't find a skill. And the National Association of Manufacturers also said 75,000 members, two-thirds of them say the number one criteria for selecting the site of a factory is having a exceptionally skilled workforce. Two is the fact that there's a heck of a PR problem. People tend to view those young people who, or middle-aged people or old people who participate in, in uh, certainly young people though, who participate in uh, career and technical education and pursue technical careers as having settled for the consolation prize of our day. They're, in Huxley terms, they're viewing them in some ways as the beta minuses of our society. And this, of course, is not true because these jobs lead to great stability and capability and fulfillment and prosperity for a family. But we now view them as the consolation prize. We have lost the respect, as I said earlier, lost the respect for dignity of work because technical work, those technical jobs, have been the bulwark of the middle class and have created the American strength we enjoy today. There is no path to prosperity without having an enabled middle class and an upskilling of the American workforce. And that won't happen unless we raise the profile and acceptability of those jobs and make them a national calling. Kennedy did this in 1960 when he said, we're going to the moon in 10 years, and every high school uh, young person in America thought that becoming a scientist or an engineer was enlisting in a national calling, almost like they were going in the army. This can be done here by leaders in business, by leaders in education, and by people in government, particularly, like, like the governor here in Oklahoma who does. Now, there's a third thing, which is priority, which is we need to support it with government, with business. And what's happening in government, I believe, is that for sure is that Congress and the Senate will endorse technical education. They'll say, we endorse it. But when push comes to shove, they will sacrifice the interests of technical education on the altar of other priorities. They'll endorse it, but they won't support it. They won't prioritize it. So when, other, when, other, when, when, they, when the time comes to allocate the money or decide where to play, uh, spend political capital, they won't do it on education. And we need to lean on them to recognize that education should be the number one priority. Now, before business can effectively lean on them, and before education can effectively lean on them, we have to actually act like it's the number one priority. And one of the part of the problem is that business itself tends to like anything that will favor business. In other words, if there's an initiative that is favorable to business, we characterize it as essential. Well, that's not really true. And so I'm willing to say for us, for me, that career and technical education is the number one thing on my priority list for a national agenda, above any kind of trade changes, above changes in the corporate income tax. And we pay high corporate income tax, and so an adjustment would favor us for sure. Yet I think education is more important. I'm willing to say that, and we need to say that directly to our leaders in both education and government and lean on them to act the same. And that creates the priority will help this. So three areas to, to enable this, this uh, career and technical education to be the weapon it deserves to be. One is call in the airstrikes and shape the curriculum to be demand driven so it fits what's needed in industry. Two, work on the PR problem and change what is a consolation prize now to a national calling and restore the respect for the dignity of work and restore the, na the American dream to what it always was, that is the middle class not some extraordinary job, which can only be occupied by a very few number of Americans. And thirdly, to ask our, our government and our educators to prioritize this as their number one priority and to act like it. Nick Pungchuk, thank you for your insights. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Sure.
Now, if you'd like to see my full conversation with Nick Pinchuk, we do have that streaming on our website as well as his entire speech, which truly is one of the best I've ever heard on workforce and the economy. Just go to OKHorizon.com and look under our value added section. You can keep up with us throughout the week. Just head to OKHorizon.com where you can see more of any of our stories, read our reporters' behind-the-scenes blogs, see what others are saying about us on Twitter, and face the facts with our regular updates. So reach out and touch us anywhere and anytime. We're a mobile society. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we'll examine how we get from here to there and meet the people that make it happen. It isn't just roads and bridges, and it isn't just waterways or trains. It's all of the ways that we transport ourselves, products, or information. Big wheels rolling on the Oklahoma Show Over the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, we are out of time. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.